Deep inside every human skull, an ancient creature lies imprisoned. It has no interest in the rules of survival. Its only nourishment is pure pleasure. In 1953, psychologist Olds accidentally found the key to awakening it. Due to a slight mistake, he misplaced the electrode that should have been implanted in the brainstem into the septum of the rat's brain. Something strange happened. When Olds pressed the button to give the rat an electric shock, it happened to be in a corner of the experimental table. After that, the rat became obsessed, returning to that corner repeatedly as if expecting something. Olds realized he might have inadvertently hit a switch that could directly create a reward within the brain. He refined the experiment by installing a lever inside a box. Whenever the rat pressed it, it triggered a self-electric shock. The result was the birth of one of the most tragic drug addicts in the history of science. The rat went mad. It pressed the lever thousands of times per hour. It forgot food, ignored sleep, and even willingly crossed an electrified grid just to get those repeated intracranial orgasms. It became a prisoner willing to die for pleasure. Without intervention, it would have died of exhaustion from endless self-stimulation. What Olds discovered was the brain's reward center. In a cruel way, it proved that once this primal pursuit of pleasure is awakened, even the instinct to survive can be abandoned. This rebellion in the iron cage was not an isolated case. Years later, American psychiatrist Heath implanted electrodes into the brains of human patients. After receiving the button, patient codenamed B-19 reported unprecedented ecstasy and protested violently when the stimulation was terminated, begging for more. What exactly is this pleasure button that can drive a being to their death? Initially, all clues pointed to dopamine. Scientists discovered that both rats' self-shock and addictive drugs like opium are achieved through the massive release of dopamine in reward centers like the nucleus accumbens. For a time, dopamine was crowned the happiness molecule, and addiction seemed to be the greedy pursuit of the pleasure it produces. However, in 1997, when Schultz pointed electrodes at monkeys' brains, he accidentally uncovered the scam. In the experiment where the monkeys were given juice when the light came on, he found that when they first tasted the juice unexpectedly, their dopamine neurons fired excitedly. But once they learned the pattern, when they actually drank the juice, their dopamine neurons went silent. Instead, dopamine spiked the moment the signal light turned on. If the expected juice didn't appear after the light came on, dopamine levels would plummet, as if expressing neurological disappointment. Schultz realized that dopamine isn't happiness itself, but rather a prediction of happiness. It encodes reward prediction errors. When reality exceeds expectations, dopamine bursts, driving us to learn how to repeat the surprise. When reality falls short, it punishes us with silence. It's not a hedonist, but a demanding mentor, ensuring we learn to survive most efficiently, not to indulge in pleasure. Soon after, another scientist, Barrage, revealed another accomplice to the rebellion. He discovered that the brain's reward system consists of two distinct parts, liking and wanting. Dopamine is the fuel for wanting, but the actual pleasure of liking is more related to opioids, such as endorphins. This means that at the core of addiction is a pernicious disconnect between wanting and liking. Repeated drug use makes the dopamine system hypersensitive, amplifying wanting to a pathological degree, while the liking system gradually becomes numb, making the same dose being weaker joy. Addicts are thus caught in a terrifying paradox. They desperately want what they no longer like. They're no longer chasing happiness, but rather an insatiable, dopamine-driven phantom of desire. So, addiction isn't a pure hedonist tyrant. It is a cunning manipulator. It hijacks our brain's oldest learning mechanism, trapping individuals in an inescapable cycle of reinforcement. This rebellion has spread beyond drugs to every corner of our lives. Slot machines and casinos use uncertain rewards to keep us hooked on the hope of a win next time. And every like and every swipe on our phones is a microdose of dopamine, tying us to our screens and trapping us in an endless cycle of desire yet rarely experiencing true enjoyment and satisfaction. Since addiction is a rebellion driven by brain mechanisms, is there any chance of escape? In 1981, an experiment by Alexander shed light on this. Believing that the previous experimental environment itself was torture, he built a mouse paradise, complete with warm sawdust, colorful toys, 
playful companions, and ample food. He then offered the mice two choices, pure water or sugar water spiked with morphine. Unlike the mice that voluntarily received electric shocks, he obtained starkly opposite results. The mice in the paradise showed little interest in the morphine water. They preferred socializing, games, and exploration. Furthermore, when Alexander moved the morphine-addicted mice in cages into the paradise, most of them gradually gave up morphine and returned to a normal life. In addition, a survey of returning Vietnam War soldiers provided similar evidence. Nearly 20% of U.S. soldiers became addicted to heroin amidst the high pressure and boredom of battle. However, after returning home, over 90% of them naturally recovered without systematic treatment. This means that addiction is closely related to environment, social connection, and whether life has a meaningful purpose. Addiction is a symptom, a cry for help, born from loneliness, trauma, or despair. When real life fulls of pain and unconsciousness, the brain instinctively seeks any substitute that can provide temporary comfort, whether it is chemical or behavioral. However, our contemporary narratives often selectively forget this. We are obsessed with the dopamine stage method, willpower training, and even pin our ultimate hopes on drugs or even more precise brain surgeries. All of this ingeniously shifts the blame back to the individual struggling in the cage, as if addiction were merely a problem with his own brain. This in itself is a more concealed form of addiction. We are addicted to personal solutions because they promise a simple and controllable future, but allow us to overlook the more serious problem. To what extent is the modern society we are in a huge, elaborately decorated Skinner box when the stable community disintegrates? When the meaning of work is alienated and consumerism constantly creates insatiable desires, have we all, to varying degrees, become those rats imprisoned alone in cages. Therefore, perhaps our true struggle against desire is not only about the individual, but also about liberating the happy prisoners in the world we share. Ultimately, it does not rely on more effective drugs or stronger willpower, but rather on a deeper social inquiry. How can we stop building those invisible cages and rebuild a human paradise for each other that can accommodate the nourishing meaning of love?